Right, are we ready for this? Ready to go? Yep. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, well, good afternoon. Um, we can advise that we've had a directions meeting this morning and uh, that is on, on the basis that we're monitoring the activities and concerns that arise from not just New South Wales but now Victoria as we've been speaking about for the last few days. And as a result of recent incidents, and Professor Spurrier will give you some detail on that, uh, we've made the decision that we are going to be changing the requirements for people coming into South Australia from Victoria. Effective now, as of midday today, uh, we are changing it so that uh, all of Victoria is deemed to be level six for Victorian residents. Essential travellers and permitted travellers, which are returning South Australians and people who are genuinely relocating and those escaping domestic violence, will be categorised as level four, which means they will be required to go into 14 days quarantine on arrival into South Australia. And they will also be required to undertake a day one, five and 13 testing regime. This is on the basis of the concerns we have in relation to the spread of COVID-19 in Victoria over the last few days. And uh, as I said, Professor Spurrier will elaborate on those concerns. It's also worth flagging to any South Australians who are currently in Victoria or thinking about travelling to Victoria, that we will be continually monitoring the situation in Victoria. And it is likely that early next week, we will make further changes, which will even prevent returning South Australians from coming in without applying for a specific exemption uh, from SA Health. I think this gives you some indication as to the level of concern we have for uh, the situation interstate and the steps we're taking to uh, prevent the possibility of spread of COVID-19 and the Delta variant into South Australia and also to enable us to uh, minimise the need for further restrictions on the South Australian community. So I'm happy to take questions now before I hand over to Professor Spurrier. So is your advice to any South Australians who are currently in Victoria and didn't rush across to, to get home now if you're planning to beef up restrictions even further next week? Well, the reality is if you're currently in Victoria as a South Australian resident planning to return, you've probably left it too late. Um, you will be required to quarantine on your arrival in South Australia and that will be a 14 day quarantine period. We believe that there are a large number of people travelled from Victoria, including regional Victoria, uh, when the Victorian government announced their SNAP lockdown, and that also coincided with the changes that we made to people coming into South Australia as returning residents as well. So we're hopeful that this doesn't impact on too many people, but uh, the reality is uh, these changes are in effect now. So if you are coming home, you will be required to comply with the conditions that are now in place. Victorians need to apply for exemptions the way that returning SA residents from New South Wales have been? Uh, people who are non-residents in South Australia, um, they're not genuinely relocating and they're not escaping domestic violence, will need to apply for an exemption and that will be dealt with by the SA Health Exemptions Committee. And there are set criteria that health are prepared to consider and usually that will include um, uh, compassionate grounds, uh, end of life visits and those sorts of things. Um, Commissioner, can I ask the travel bubble, the 70 kilometre travel bubble, is that still in place? The 70 kilometre travel bubble for Victoria is still in place. It operates in the manner that people who live within 70 kilometres of the border are able to travel into South Australia but they can only travel into South Australia for 70 kilometres. So that does not give them licence to travel right through South Australia. They can only cross the border for their normal daily activities, which they would be a normal part of their lives being so close to the South Australian border and community. So just to be clear, the, the, the border, the 70 kilometre hour, the 70 kilometre wide border is effectively 140 kilometres, but 70 each yes, side. That's, that's a good way to describe it, yeah. Commissioner, um, you brought in um, more requirements for those who've been come from overseas into via New South Wales um, coming into South Australia. Why is it that Port Adelaide can travel to Melbourne and come back in without quarantine? You've got a full capacity out of that. Well, I know these things aren't exactly legal. You can't yep. manage people coming from a, a bubble in a hotel isolation into South Australia. Okay, so there's two parts to that question. We've made changes for international arrivals who do their 14 days hotel quarantine in New South Wales in, in Sydney or ACT are required on arrival in South Australia now to do 14 days of home quarantine. The reason for that is because of the extent of the virus spread through uh, Greater Sydney particularly is of such concern that we can no longer be confident that people can move through a sterile corridor from the Medi Hotel to the airport and travel back to South Australia safely. So we need to take those steps to ensure the safety of the South Australian community. In terms of football, um, People shouldn't be under the illusion that football players are allowed to move uh, freely through the community when they're not engaged in uh, training or, or competition. They are 
living and working under the AFL guidelines and protocols for um, COVID-19, which puts fairly significant restrictions on them. So uh, AFL players have a def different set of um, requirements than every other member of the community, and it's on the basis of that and the other protections that are put in place for game days that enables us to allow teams to come in, play their games and leave, and it also enables the South Australian-based teams to participate in those competitions with a level of safety that we are satisfied minimises the risk of COVID-19 spreading into the community. And I, I just have to stress, you know, this is a, a large industry and it's also uh, an important part of the fabric of our community. Um, you know, I couldn't imagine being in 14 days quarantine and not being able to watch footy. So it, there are a lot of dimensions to this we try and manage. Can I ask about a case about a woman who's rushed back from overseas? She's a South Australian expat. She's now in um, hotel quarantine in Sydney. Uh, her mum is dying of cancer. She doesn't know how long she's got. That must, she's now facing a month in isolation. It must be incredibly distressing for her. Can you see that? Absolutely. Please don't think we make these decisions um, without any uh, appreciation of the consequence of these decisions. And we've spoken about this before. Uh, these are difficult decisions because we know just how they affect people socially, uh, mentally, uh, economically. Uh, we know people lose their jobs, they lose shifts, uh, uh, businesses struggle to keep, uh, keep viable. We're not immune to that and these compassionate circumstances will be dealt with specifically by SA Health and I'm sure they will be working with that particular person to provide every opportunity, if it can be done safely, for that person to have an end of life visit. Thursday night police were ra waving cars through at the border when there was that line that yep. became a traffic hazard. How concerned are you that there may have been people among those travellers who we're not aware of um, who might be carrying that Delta variant? Uh, the majority of people who uh, were able to be waved through were in all likelihood uh, subject to level three restrictions, which means they have to test on day one, five and 13. That obligation still remains, so these people would have been uh, making an application to enter South Australia on our cross-border travel application platform, and that would have advised them of their obligation. So the, 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 the fact that we waved them through doesn't alleviate them of their obligation, and we were balancing the need to scrutinise people on entry with the, the weather conditions and also the significant traffic conditions so that we did it as safely as possible. So it's all about managing risk. I think the team out on the borders did a very good job. Uh, I certainly support their decision making on the day. There is a risk though that potentially there might be some people that have gone through without the paperwork that you're not going to be aware of. So well, there's a level of yep. faith there? Absolutely there is. Um, we've been relying on the community to do the right thing in every dimension of our COVID-19 response. We rely on people to be honest when they fill in their cross-border application and we rely on them to turn up to the testing sites and get their tests done. It's also important to note that if these people had come through just a matter of hours before, they would have been waved through anyway. So it's because of the higher level of understanding, because we do the press conference and we tell people about the change, that we have this sort of focus and we do have the rush to the border. Commissioner, can I just ask you, um, uh, I appreciate it's probably an obvious question, you just given a verbal direction? Um, no, I've, I've actually signed the direction. Uh, I signed the direction at 11.51 this morning to take effect as of midday. So this direction is already in place as a written direction. Um, this, the purpose of the press conference is to alert people to the change uh, and give people an opportunity to make whatever arrangements they need to make or cancel plans they have in terms of travelling to regional Victoria. And as a follow-up, um, I appreciate the, the overarching message that you gave before, but can you go into any specifics that, um, that either Professor Spurrier or anyone else from Health provided you in terms of the concern regarding Victoria in the, in the directions meeting this morning? Well, unless there's any more questions for me, I might hand to Professor Spurrier who can give the details in relation to the Victorian situation and, and the advice that was provided to me. That One question in terms of the truck drivers. You guys are having a meeting with the union yep. and SA Pathology on Monday. What are you going to canvas in that meeting? So uh, just a few days ago, we made changes to the direction that required truck drivers to produce evidence of a COVID test having been undertaken within 48 hours of arriving in South Australia or to undertake it within 24 hours of arrival. Um, we've had feedback from the industry that this is, uh, in their view, quite onerous. Uh, we did this because of the obvious concerns that arise from the removalists who fit within the definition of um, freight drivers having been tested and found positive uh, in South Australia. Now, we are going to work with the industry to find some um, midpoint where we, we're satisfied that we're sufficiently protecting the South Australian community but not impeding the, the movement of freight into and out of South Australia and not adversely affecting the people who work in that industry. So that meeting will be happening on Monday and we'll be able to provide further information to the sector and also uh, more, pub more generally to the public after that meeting. But I'm, I'm confident we'll come to an end point there that we'll, we'll 
take this issue off the table. What's your um, reaction or comment, I guess, to the threats from some Victorian drivers to blockade the, the state border because of these new onerous rules? I, I think um, I'd expect or hope that they appreciate the steps we are taking are in the best interests of the broader community of South Australia. Uh, we're doing the same as every other state and territory in Australia, trying to protect our community from the Delta variant of COVID-19. Um, I would also expect that they would understand that the steps we put in place were because of a positive test with a freight driver. But on the same token, I would hope that they will um, hold off on any further um, threats of action until we've had the meeting and we've been able to work through this with industry representatives. I appreciate um, both you and Professor Spiria uh, talk about hindsight and it's a very unhelpful um, thing to do. Um, the industry, um, when we spoke to them, said that they've been incredibly safe for the past 15 months and until the three removalists who the Victorian authorities described as rogue operators. Um, they, there was no community transmission from freight drivers and they mm. have very onerous testing. Was, was it again a, an overreaction to bring in these testing requirements from Thursday without sufficient consultation? With the industry? We don't get a lot of time to make these decisions. Um, we're dealing with um, an emerging situation in New South Wales, and this, this was a step taken particularly for the situation in New South Wales before Victoria became of more concern. And the fact that we're now dealing with a different strain of the COVID-19 virus, something that is much more highly transmissible. So it, whilst we acknowledge that the, uh, the, the freight industry has not been the subject of a positive case that's seen it travel across borders. We can't be confident going forward that a person who works and lives in New South Wales won't be exposed to the virus and uh, inadvertently bring it across into South Australia. So uh, we acknowledge the fact that we don't have any particular historical concerns with the industry and we think they've been doing a very good job in, in terms of their own code of practice. But we are looking at the bigger picture here and the extent of the spread of this virus and how easily it can spread and we're taking those steps we believe necessary to protect South Australia. Are you frustrated that we're now still imposing all of these restrictions where the, the, the fluid nature of it and the, the changing to and from restrictions, no restrictions, etc. Are you frustrated that we're still at this point, Commissioner, so far into the pandemic? Uh, look, I think that would be... Um it's probably unhelpful to describe it that way. We, you need to deal with the, the reality of the circumstances. This is a global pandemic. Australia's been very lucky so far. Uh, we've been taking steps. We've been active. We've been proactive in terms of our response, and I think it served us well in South, in South Australia particularly. Uh, I can't say I'm frustrated. Uh, this, this is a reality of dealing with a global pandemic, and so far, so good. Let's, uh, let's hope that we maintain that level of community compliance uh, the support of the community that is absolutely critical to, to us getting this right and uh, taking those steps that will protect South Australia. So we'll, we'll keep doing what we have to do. Can I'll hand over. Oh, sorry, just on QR check-ins, do you have the numbers from yesterday? I understand Thursday's check-ins were the highest since Christmas Eve. I think the 13th of uh, July we had something like 1.75 million check-ins in one day, which was a high, and then I think the day after that we cracked 1.8. So. Um, all the signs are really good that the majority of the community are on board with this. They are doing the right thing. They understand how important it is. Um, but we do get these uh, regular reminders, such as uh, the Shell Service Station in Tail and Bend, where there are some people still not doing it. And we, the message is pretty clear. It's, it's really important. We've just got to get on board. Uh, Professor, thanks. Thank you. And just a, perhaps a follow up about the freight. And I absolutely acknowledge that um, the freight industry have been fantastic dur during the pandemic. Um, and people may not remember from last year, but uh, we did in fact have a freight driver who was a case that passed through South Australia, followed all the instructions, wore a mask. It was contactless delivery um, and we didn't have any seating at that time. But um, there is always a risk when you have people travelling into the state from a high risk area. Um, and so uh, this is the reason why we've required um, increasing testing in that particular industry.
Uh, so I'll give a very brief South Australian update, but uh, more importantly, focus on um, the reasons for making these decisions today. So um, people will be pleased to know we've had no new cases in our state today. Uh, so that includes our Medi hotels. We've currently got 14 active cases, nobody in hospital, um, and we had uh, nearly 9,500 COVID-19 tests done yesterday. So that's a really good number. It means that South Australians are stepping up and getting tested when they have symptoms. And what we know uh, with this pandemic is um, even though uh, there might not be any known active cases in South Australia, uh, the only reason we can tell is if people are getting tested. So thank you for that. So let's have a look at Victoria and discuss that briefly. Um, as people will know, unfortunately, Victoria had uh, cases from New South Wales, from that New South Wales outbreak into their state um, over the last week or so. And there was a, a significant transmission event at the MCG with um, now uh, a, an increasing number of people have become infected there and then they've moved throughout um, the state. So I was given information last night um, that we have uh, um, exposure sites in um, uh, the uh, Phillip Island region. Now if people have been to Victoria and know Phillip Island it is a beautiful place and it's a tourist destination and there are a large number of exposure sites there so that's getting outside of um, the inner city metropolitan Melbourne. And it is school holidays for us here still in South Australia and it has been in Victoria as well. And so indeed um, there was a, a case that went to all of these tourist sites in Phillip Island. So Victoria is currently in a lockdown, so it means that there's less movement of people around Victoria, but there's a real risk and a real concern both from a Victorian perspective, but also our perspective, that there will be uh, people who have been tourists in that area who will be now moving back to their home, um, uh, and that could be in South Australia or indeed in Victoria. So in addition to um, what the police commission has said about now from this point in time, anyone coming back to South Australia will require 14 days of quarantine. And that is strict 14 days of quarantine with the three lots of testing and there's no ifs or buts, that's just what has to happen. We will also be contacting, um, we're using all of the, the information that we've got about um, the QR scanning and also the border declaration. We'll also be contacting anybody that has indicated that they've been in Phillip Island um, between the 12th and the 15th. And those people will also require quarantine, um, but we will be doing that as a direction um, with those individuals themselves. We had information up on our website last night about a, um, uh, urging people to get tested if they'd been to Phillip Island, but just letting people know that um, unfortunately, because of the high risk now in that particular area, we will be asking people to, um, to quarantine for that 14 days. And I just want to thank the South Australian community um, for uh, complying with that, those quarantine requirements, because if we don't all do this, we will unfortunately um, have the Delta variant here as well. Uh, the risk across New South Wales and now across Victoria is increasing. This is the highest risk that we have experienced uh, since the Victorian second wave. It is the Delta variant is very transmissible. And I was thinking visually, it feels to me like we've got a, a dam when we've got our borders in place and the water's coming up behind it and we're getting more and more cases. And we're trying to hold that back by um, having our border controls. Um, but uh, we all need to be mindful that it is um, porous, that it's possible for people to come across and uh, not be aware that they might be carrying this virus. So it's important for all of us to think about the symptoms that we've got. Continue to do the QR check-ins, everybody. Um, it's absolutely the safest thing we can do for our contact tracers. And if it's, uh, you, you're eligible to be vaccinated, please don't hold off. Uh, if you're above um, 60, go and have the AstraZeneca. I'm so pleased my mother's now had her two doses. My husband's due his second dose and I will be feeling much more comfortable when my family is protected. Um, people under 60, you're able to have Pfizer, go and get vaccinated. It is the best thing that you can do for yourself but for the rest of the community. Um, so I just wanted to uh, give you a few more numbers um, uh, in terms of some of the messaging that we've been doing out to individual people. 
Um, we've had uh, a, an SMS to people from Victoria who've come back from Victoria and we've had, um, it was 12,498 text messages sent and we've had up to this point in time 7,000 responses. So if you happen to have received a text message from SA Health, please respond to that. We'll ask you to fill out a survey and we're looking for people that may have been to exposure sites and those sites are increasing uh, as we speak. Um, and we've had, uh, out of that number of people, 236 people from Victoria saying that they have indeed been at an exposure site. So you can see, um, because we have a lot of travel between the states, that it, it is certainly a risk for us here. Um, we also have an, another SMS for people from New South Wales. So we're a bit disappointed with the amount of testing um, that we've seen from people that have come into our state from New South Wales. And this is, again, really important. So we sent out um, about 1,500 SMSs this morning, uh, reminding those people um, that it is a requirement to be tested if you're from New South Wales, and that there are penalties uh, that exist if we don't have those tests done. Um, and now a very brief update on Tail and Bend, and um, I'm very pleased that we haven't had any positive cases come out of that. We have 293 people in quarantine from the exposures at Tail and Bend from those removalists. That number has dropped slightly. Um, my team has been working through and calling up those people and working out what times they were either at the um, Shell service station or at the on the run, um, and it's, it's dropped because sometimes people were not there at the exact time of exposure. So that's where I I've got to in terms of my update today, but very happy to take further questions. So that dropped from 367 yesterday, so um, more than 70 people have been notified that they mm -hmm. no longer have to yep. quarantine. Yeah. I guess when you look at Melbourne and, and what's going on there, how are we so lucky? Are we, as the threat ease from these removals coming through our state, or are you still concerned? Look, I think we've got the actual risk when the removalists were here, but what it indicates to me is if we have one group of people, and we were lucky because they were actually, that those uh, two gentlemen had tests done, and so we knew that they were positive, but if there's one uh, person that's come across and was positive, it is likely that there could be other people that have could, uh, could have come across and also be carrying the virus. And this is why that this is um, a, such a tricky thing to deal with in the pandemic, because the virus is invisible, and we can't see it being there. And so what we're looking at there's a risk in another state and perhaps thinking, well, you know, we're fine here, we've got the borders in place. But this is why I will always say to the South Australian public, everybody has a part to play. Uh, if you have symptoms, don't just assume it's a, a, a normal cold. It could be COVID and you need to get tested. So are contact tracers confident that they've now tracked all of the movements of these removalists or are they still actively... Um, investigating where they may have been in their say? Um, I think we're pretty confident now. We've had um, the uh, uh, police have worked very closely with us um, to look at other ways of getting that information. And we've also had a chance to speak to one of these gentlemen um, in, this, in his um, native uh, language. And I think we're feeling quite confident that we know where those uh, gentlemen were. Uh, but as I said, it's uh, we can um, uh, feel like we've put a ring fence around that risk. We also don't know absolutely that we've got everybody who was in the Shell service station and on the run uh, at that time because not everybody, unfortunately, was, was uh, QR checking in. It, I'm really happy to hear that we've got an increased um, number of QR check-ins, so uh, it makes me feel really pleased that um, South Australians are listening to this. I always check in when I go to a service station. It's sometimes not obvious and you're racing in and out as you're filling your, your petrol, um, but please uh, follow all of those guidelines. You described the MCG as a transmission event in this case. Um, in Victoria, does it make you rethink um, the rules around Adelaide Oval and um, the capacity that we've been allowing there? Uh, it's not the capacity so much, it's the setup. And um, I've been um, uh, trying to seek as much information as I can from Victoria. They're still doing the investigation. So um, as in our oval, there's very good CCTV footage. And so you can actually have a look and see where an individual has gone and, and where they've um, uh, walked during the time that they've been at the oval. So they're just trying to piece together um, where exactly those transmissions occurred. The um, uh, original case had gone into the bar, had used the bathroom facilities, so it may have been that the transmission have occurred in indoor um, areas, but uh, we're still, that the jury's really open on that at the moment, but it's certainly something that we're all looking at around Australia. Is there more that um, can be done to support people like Mel Lukovic 
which has come back into Australia, an expat, and her mum is dying, and she's been told she might have to face a month in isolation, or she might be able to get back if she charters her own flight. I mean, is there more that can be done to support these people? Um, one of the problems is, is of course, flying interstate. And uh, if you're on a flight, you're sitting um, next to other people, um, uh, ne next to other uh, Australians um, who don't have the disease. And so it certainly is a, bit, a very real risk. We've seen transmission occur on flights before. When we have people who are quarantining in our own state, we are able to do end of life visits. We have very good system in place to use sterile corridors and testing before and after. Um, but it's very difficult if somebody is indeed in another state. Look, I think that that really is a national issue um, and it depends where the flights are coming from. So our flights don't come from the US. So if somebody's travelled from the US, they will have to come into Sydney. Um, so there is a limit to what can be done. Um, look, we are looking at these sorts of questions at AHPPC, but it's very early days in terms of our understanding of how effective the vaccine is. Um, we know it is incredibly effective at stopping you getting very sick, and you need the to have the two doses. So another message from me today, if you've had your one dose, go and get your second dose, um, because it's much more effective if you've had both doses. Um, so what, we're, uh, what we don't have full information about is we do know that people can still get infected, even though they've been vaccinated vaccinated and we know that some of those people can still transmit the disease. So we are looking at uh, making some modifications down the track but whilst we have um, the majority of people not vaccinated in Australia I don't think we'd be taking that risk. And in regard to the just explain a bit just for people who don't understand why they have to undertake the extra two weeks, what is the health justification? Yes, yeah, so um, what uh, became apparent last week was that um, there was a young uh, boy who was quarantining in Sydney in one of their their um, health, what they call it a health hotel, and then he travelled um, up to Brisbane with his uh, mother. And he got sick when he got back to Brisbane, did the right thing and got tested, and unfortunately he was positive for COVID. But the um, uh, other part of that puzzle is that the strain that he has been infected with is the strain from New South Wales. So um, at some point in his journey from the um, health hotel up to Brisbane, um, he has become positive. Now, Obviously, um, uh, there's all sorts of places that, that might have occurred. I've spoken to New South Wales and I um, ve feel very confident that their health hotel is under um, extremely good control. There's no sense that there's been another outbreak within that health hotel. But you do need to travel to the airport in some way. It's not usually in a private car. Um, and you do need to pass through the airport. Um, so at this point in time for New South Wales, we are going to require people to have an additional two weeks of home quarantine when they get back to South Australia. Not hotel quarantine, but home quarantine. And again, it seems a long time ago, but we had the same uh, rule in place last year during our first wave um, of the uh, pandemic. In regards to the 12,500 texts that have gone out to return travellers from Victoria, when's that since? Because a couple of days ago, um, Dr Kirkpatrick said around 7,000 had gone out and 150 um, people required going into quarantine. Um, so does this include those? Or oh, I'll just have to check that for you. Um, and to, I think this is in total. Um, so it probably includes those numbers from the other day. As things are in, unfolding in Victoria and we get more exposure sites and we have more people returning to South Australia, we're obviously catching up and wanting to send messages to those people as well. And so what, what date would this be from then? Uh, I'll check that for you. Thank you. Professor, are you comfortable with the current level of internal restrictions in South Australia? Um, and if not, what would you be looking to recommend to the Commissioner over the coming days? Um, I'm quite comfortable with the current level of restrictions, but only if people are following them. And uh, so it is very important to, to sort of be alert, but not alarmed in South Australia. We haven't got any cases here. We are monitoring the situation. People are getting uh, testing done. That's excellent. Um, so it just is important that people are following the current restrictions, uh, which uh, also includes 
of course doing that QR coding. Um, so when we look at any internal restrictions, it is a fine balance between uh, economic and social um, outcomes and also health outcomes. And I think this has really struck the right balance at this point in time. If things change, well, of course, we'll have to look at it again. <coughs> um, do you the um, um, mask wearing rule, um, is it correct that they're not required <coughs> in hospitals at the moment, but they are required in aged care facilities and prisons? Yes, that's correct, although there are some places within a hospital where masks are required and those are higher risk areas like the respiratory ward um, or the emergency department. So uh, each individual hospital can make up its own policy just, uh, regardless of what our um, mandate is through a direction. And so some private hospitals may require people to wear masks at any point in time. Can I just um, check the direction on Philip Island because it says here um, on the website that you need to quarantine until you get a negative result, but has that changed to quarantine for 14 days? Yes, so we've updated that this morning. So the information we put up out last night was just to get tested until you've got a negative result and then we'll, we'll, we will be working to contact all of those people that we um, that indicate they've come from that area so that we can um, require them to have quarantine. And nationally we have um, a slump on weekends traditionally when it comes to the vaccines. Is there anything we can do here in South Australia to boost um, vaccination appointments on Saturdays and Sundays? Look, I might pass over to the Minister on that one, if yeah, that's all right. Sure. Thank you. I'd like to make the point that our mass vaccination clinics have gone to a uh, seven day a week operation. Uh, we are very keen to make sure that uh, vaccines are accessible to people, particularly uh, people who might not be able to come through normal business hours. And that's why a number of clinics have, uh, have also introduced uh, one or more um, uh, days where they provide uh, after hours appointments. Uh, only this week I was at uh, Kangaroo Island and, and uh, was able to be part of the vaccination clinic there. Uh, it was uh, great to see the uh, continuing to roll out the uh, vaccination sites. Uh, on Monday we'll be opening a, a new clinic at uh, Port Lincoln and also a new clinic at Gawler. We we'll have continued to look at opportunities to um, expand the vaccination uh, appointments and we're delighted that South Australians in greater and greater numbers are stepping forward to get tested. Professor, sorry, if we could call you back. I know that previously you said that you don't support the mandatory vaccination of people. Is it time now to re-look at that? Uh, look, we're certainly looking at that. And at the beginning of the year when the vaccines were first rolled out, we had good information about how it um, uh, reduced the severity of the disease for individuals. But what we didn't know about was how much it stopped you getting infected. And importantly, if you did get infected, could you transmit it to somebody else? But we have much better information about that now. Uh, we know that um, for both of the vaccines combined, there's up to 70% roughly uh, stopping you actually getting infected and then if you do get infected it's around about up to 45 percent of stopping you transmitting it to somebody else now knowing that's important because that would give a justification for mandating vaccine for certain groups so some of those groups that we have been looking at and um, uh, working through uh, how we would um, uh, be best to mandate that include people that work in our red zones so that's in our medi hotels and also in the quarantine stream and also of course uh, as has been spoken about at a national level, people that work in our aged care facility. So those are certainly things that we're now looking at, uh, knowing what we do know about the vaccines. Um, can I just, um, just to clarify, um, do you think it is time, or is it something that you guys, at the AHPPC or whoever, are looking at the mandatory vaccination of the, of the population, not necessarily high risk um, professions? No, that's not something that we've uh, been ever discussing because I think at the end of the day we do need a choice in terms of um, being able to be vaccinated but there are certainly some areas where there are, are people that are at very high risk of dying if they catch COVID-19 um, as in aged care uh, and also there are uh, um, the risk to the whole of Australia the quarantine stream. Can we that point of choice now though Professor? Like we, you know, we can't get out of this mess because people aren't getting vaccinated, do we now need to seriously look at making it mandatory to try and 
try and end this COVID and these press conferences and all of this sort of stuff because people are sick and tired of lockdowns and rules and is it, is it now time to look at that? Look, I think the other way of looking at it is what is our vaccination rate? What is our hesitancy? In South Australia, we've had so many people come forward and get vaccinated without requiring it to be mandated. We know that there has been a supply issue and we obviously were throwing the curveball with uh, AstraZeneca and that very, very rare side effect with the um, blood clotting. However, despite all of that, we've had a great uptake of people getting vaccinated in our state. And I think that for the vast majority of people, uh, that is the way to go. As South Australians understand that um, these are extremely good vaccines, this is the modern way of dealing with the pandemic, and I'm pretty confident we will get very high rates of vaccine coverage in our state. Final questions, please. How are we going with the supply of Pfizer? I know it's hard to get an appointment at the moment. Are they starting to pick up at all? Now, I've had a couple of days off, and I'm going to pass over to the police, uh, uh, to um, the, the Minister, just to uh, uh, finish that question. Thank you. As the, uh, as the professor said, we, we are um, looking forward to more supplies. My understanding is that there's about another 25,000 uh, vaccines coming in on Tuesday as part of our weekly delivery. Uh, we, we, have, we do have concerns in terms, of, um, in terms of maintaining supply through to the significant increase in supply from September uh, going forward, but uh, we're having very positive discussions with the Commonwealth about the, um, the revision of the Horizons document. Uh, we uh, are, are very pleased with South Australia stepping forward as the as the Professor Spurrier said, um, we've had a good response so far. My understanding is that the latest uh, figure was about 45% uh, of South Australians have received their first dose uh, in terms of in, in the context of the working target. Uh, I, I certainly agree with uh, Professor Spurrier uh, that, uh, that we should continue to maintain our commitment to the Australian people that the, the vaccine will be uh, free and voluntary. Uh, we don't want to, want to get people's backs up because we're talking about a general mandating to the general population. I'm very confident that working with the South Australian community, as supplies become more available, uh, we will be, we'll, we'll have an effective vaccination rate to help, help us move out of this pandemic. I appreciate that it is almost 18 months since this pandemic started, but I'm very uh, in, uh, confident uh, in the spirit of the South Australian people. Uh, every day, uh, people are saying, let's get this done. Uh, they're committed to um, doing what's necessary to protect public health. They know how serious the challenge is, but they also are greatly encouraged by, by the uh, results we're seeing on the ground. And I'm seeing no waning of the public's commitment to back our public health team and keep South Australia safe and strong. Are all of those 25,000 doses, Pfizer doses, and just to confirm, you said you are concerned about the issue with supply by September? I think all states and territories have made it clear that we that we would like more, particularly more Pfizer. Uh, but th this is this is a very dynamic situation, as Professor Spurrier said. When we started this vaccination program in February and March, we weren't to know that there was going to be two major recalibrations of the advice on AstraZeneca. Uh, the, the Commonwealth had, government has been able to bring forward some of the future supplies of Pfizer, so to increase the supplies that are, are available. But we, we, we in the South Australian level, are going to, uh, have had discussions with the Commonwealth this, this week. We'll have more discussions with the Commonwealth next week. We've got to make sure that we get the balance right uh, in partnership with the GP network, in partnership with the, uh, the pharmacies that are coming online. We need to make sure that all of our distribution networks are optimised so that we can maximise the vaccination rate. Sorry, just to clarify. Are those 25,000 doses Pfizer or a mix of they're, they're, all, they're all Pfizer and those ones are all for SA Health. They're, of course, the uh, Commonwealth uh, di distributes directly uh, to, to GPs and will also be di di distributing directly to pharmacists. Are we getting our fair share from the Commonwealth? This, the, basically, the distribution has been on a, a per capita basis. Obviously, uh, in the context of an outbreak, clinical decisions are made to, um, to supply, um, in this case, New South Wales, uh, it may well be happening with Victoria too, I don't know. But uh, every Australian knows we're all in this together. Um, we're not safe till all of us are safe. And so we uh, strongly support um, the, our, our sister states and territories uh, in, ma in maximising the vaccination and outbreak context. Uh, but my understanding is that in terms of the, shall we say, the base supply, uh, that's distributed on a per capita basis. Okay, thanks ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.